Welcome to The Shed Wireless, a podcast from the Australian Men's Shed Association, shoulder to shoulder, virtually. Hello and welcome to Series 2 of The Shed Wireless. Coming up, tell him he's dreaming. This episode is going straight to the pool room. Legendary Australian actor and friend of the Shed movement, Michael Caton, is here to talk life, health, Bonnie Doon, and how his life was turned around after he hit rock bottom. I know you're going to love that chat. We feature the very first Shed in our new Shed in the Spotlight series, and it is the sparkling, the remarkable Raymond Terrace Men's Shed. You'll also hear the story of one shedder who had a horrific stroke before his 40th birthday, just months after moving halfway around the world to a new country and with a young family. The way the shed movement has lifted him and taken his life to a level of happiness that he could never have imagined in his darkest hour is a story you're going to want to hear. We'll learn all about the Raymond Terrace Men's Shed's legendary music group and their grand plans for a grand tour to raise money. Rip Woodchip tries to get fitter. Stuart Torrance will be here with some slightly better advice than Rip. All of that and much more ahead in this episode of The Shed Wireless. Hello, I'm Aaron Carney and we are joined for episode one of series two by the chairman of the Australian Men's Shed Association, Paul Sladden. Hello. How are you today? Yes, great. Thank you. Welcome, not for the first time, to The Shed Wireless. Now, our much-loved CEO, David Helmers, will be sharing the co-hosting duties with you in Series 2. But as we'll discuss at length in a moment, you live in regional Victoria. And we really did hope by this stage, we'd all be talking about the shutters coming up and the whole of Australia and the world moving the other side of the COVID crisis. But Your capital, Melbourne, is still a key concern, and I guess as somebody who is in Victoria but isn't in Melbourne, what's your daily reality at the moment? Well, yes, obviously Melbourne is the concern. Melbourne and the Mitchell Shire, which is to the north of uh, of Melbourne, they are in lockdown, and uh, as we've seen over the uh, the last couple of days, the numbers have been climbing and it is a concern because there is some concern about regional Victoria and what's happening in regional Victoria. There are some uh, small hotspots in regional Victoria, but outside of Melbourne and the Mitchell Shire, we're still being very mindful of the rules of social distancing, etc., and the effect that it's having on sheds outside of that area uh, is that they are being very careful with uh, how they're operating and uh, some are insisting on wearing of masks and they are doing testings etc temperature checks for guys coming into the shed so yeah look I suppose people are alert but not too alarmed here uh, in the regional Victoria but uh, Obviously, all those sheds that had reopened in Melbourne in the Mitchell Shire, unfortunately, then had to go back into lockdown. So it's been a bit of a double whammy for them. So it's been rather unfortunate. Do you feel a bit divorced from your capital at the moment? Well, it, 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 it's difficult. I have children down there. I have a daughter. She's a nurse uh, down at one of the major hospitals in Melbourne, lives and works there. Uh, my son has just returned to university, so he has been... Uh, up here with me uh, for the past ooh, three months, nearly. And it's, yeah, uh, I'm a little concerned of his return back to university, living on campus, but hopefully they uh, will stay safe. So while it's, you know, um, we we really feel and support those people in Melbourne uh, and what they're going through, uh, we're just hoping that uh, things do improve and we'll see what the numbers are today. But it is of concern. But we wish them all the best. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we just wanted, with you being based in Victoria, to touch base on that news. I think it's the truth that I caught up with family from Queensland over the weekend. And Queensland is like another planet. Or Brisbane is a different planet to Melbourne, if you want to put it that way at the moment. And all over Australia, we can often feel like we are living in a different reality. Well, that is particularly true at the moment. And as you say, on behalf of AMSA and everyone, we wish everybody in the South the very best. And fingers crossed we can come through this whole thing. I wanted to talk 
on a much brighter note about a few of the exciting new additions that we have for Series 2 of the Shed Wireless and also the return of some old favourites. So new, well, first things first, Paul is going to be participating as a co-host along with David Helmers throughout Series 2. I'm really excited about the potential of this segment, but it is going to rely on you, the listeners, making it come to life. So we have a new segment called Ask the Doc. You'll hear it very shortly here on this episode. Professor Rob McLaughlin from our partners Healthy Mail is going to come on and basically do an, as the kids call it, an AMA, ask me anything. So we are effectively offering you a free anonymous appointment with the doctor. It's as simple as, and you can do it anonymously with a non de plume, whatever, call yourself Captain X, if you like, and just send us an email and ask about anything. Now, he and his friends, the access that he has to other experts can answer absolutely anything health-wise, but his particular area of expertise is in male sexual function. And so if you did have a question in that regard, it's not always the sort of thing you want to swagger into the GP and start uh, shooting from the hip about. So we do have that service. Stay tuned for more on that. And having said everything that we've just said about the challenges in certain parts of Australia right now, given that we have hope that we are moving the other side of the COVID crisis, we wanted to make Series 2 back on the shop floor, as it were, get back inside the sheds. And so there's going to be, in each episode, a Shed in the Spotlight series. And it's going to be made up of a number of elements. The first is Show and Tell where we will give you the opportunity to showcase a project or product from your shed, and the rest of us will learn all about it, and you'll hear Raymond Terraces shortly. Then, Shedder in the Spotlight, where we meet and learn about the life of one of our shedders, and you have to hear this one from Raymond Terrace. Talk about being handed a lemon in life and having some mates who turned it into lemonade, but all will be revealed on that. And then Shed Story, which is a little bit like the Working in the Shed segment from Series 1, where basically every shed has its own individual flavour and identity, and we find out what it is in each of the sheds in the spotlight. We're going to continue to have a series of really interesting guest interviews, and Michael Caton is today's, but there's a heap of your favourites from Series 1 returning as well, including Stuart Torrance, who's going to be joining us about staying strong, healthy, basically just keeping a good, strong, healthy life as we age as men. Rip Woodchip is back with his particular flavour of shop floor wisdom, and we're going to have your correspondence in the mailbag as well, which leads us to this little bit of correspondence that fell between Series 1 and Series 2. Uh, you can write us an email anytime to theshedwireless at menshed.net. And we heard from Terry at the Ipswich Men's Shed regarding the legend of Dougie's log saw. And I quote from that correspondence from Terry. In late 2018, one of our shed members asked if it was possible to build a mobile log saw in the engineering shed at the Ipswich Men's Shed. Luckily, one of our members, Ross, had experience in constructing such items, and so began the saga of building Dougie's saw. With Doug supplying all the steel and specialised bits like engine, pulleys, axles, wheels, etc., the construction commenced. With Ross and Doug supplying the majority of the labour and a couple of other shedders holding and pushing bits when required, the saw slowly took shape. It is 8 metres long, 1.8 metres wide and is recognised as a road registered trailer with tandem axles. The bed is able to be folded in half for transport and extended when working to enable loading and the support of long logs. The saw is mounted on a moving frame and is capable of rolling along the bed and being adjusted to any height. It's able to process logs of 900 millimetres in diameter and 5,600 millimetres long. The bandsaw blade has a length of 3,800 millimetres. The project was completed mid-March 2019. Not a bad effort for two days a week and a Christmas break in the middle. Doug is currently fine-tuning the saw, making adjustments to ensure a true cut while at the same time processing a large pine tree into workable slabs. The power is supplied via a 13-horsepower Honda driving, a pair of suitably geared V-belts, 
And this project is the biggest ever undertaken by our shed. And while Ross declares there will not be a second one, both he and Doug should be congratulated on achieving a successful outcome. Doug also made a financial contribution to the shed to cover ancillary costs incurred. Doug is very happy with the finished product and with the aid of his grandson is putting it to work, cutting slabs, ensuring a supply of timber for the construction of his beehives and other ongoing projects. Terry, past president of the Ipswich Men's Shed. Thank you for the update. Congratulations to Ross and Doug for their legendary saw. If you head to the Men's Shed online, we will have some pictures of Dougie's saw up there so you can get some sense of what it looks like. That's the sort of correspondence we welcome. And indeed, it sounds like Ipswich might need to be one of our sheds in the spotlight at some point. So thank you for that correspondence. Send it through to the shed wireless at menshed.net. Now, Paul, I caught up with Michael Caton a few days ago. And so the whole discussion that I had with him as to how we came to him sort of via you was all covered in the introduction that you'll hear in a moment. But at the risk of repeating a few details, I just wanted to get to the bottom of this. You live at Bonnie Doon, which is the holiday destination that was immortalised in that iconic Australian movie, The Castle. First of all, is that right? From memory, when we spoke to you in Series 1, you said you could more or less, if you stood on tippy toes, see the Kerrigan's Holiday House as it was depicted in the movie. Is that right? Ah, that's correct, Darren. Yes, yes. It's it's not too far away from me where I am in beautiful downtown Bonnie Doon. Yes, the uh, the Holiday House at, down at uh, Maiton Goon Road. Uh, it's still there, still standing still proudly under the uh, the power lines and you can see the jousting sticks from the road there in the window and the punching bag and uh, Coco's kennel is uh, is all there. Does somebody actually live there? Well, uh, people did live there, but it's now, uh, obviously since the film, past 23 years now, it's been a holiday house. So people can rent it out. So if you want to come, come on down to... Um, to Serenity, you can actually stay in the Holiday House. It, it, it's available as a holiday rental. As you'll hear in the chat with Michael, considering what a cultural icon that movie has become, it didn't really make much money and it cost next to nothing in terms of movie budgets. But what did it do for Bonnie Doon and that broader area that you live in? Seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars was the uh, was the total budget for the film, but it certainly put Bonnie Doon on the map. I mean, but Bonnie Doon has always been a, a favoured uh, holiday destination, with um, right on the uh, you know it, it's right on Lake Eildon. Lake Eildon's the largest inland waterway in Victoria. Uh, it's five times the size of Sydney Harbour, five hundred and fifteen kilometres of shoreline. Uh, so it's a, it's a very popular fishing, boating, uh, houseboat, skiing, water skiing destination. But really, uh, following that film, as we know, we've got all those fantastic lines from the movie that now have become part of the uh, Australian uh, lexicon and going to Bonnie Doon and Serenity and, and all of those uh, has, have certainly lifted the profile of the town. And, and even today, you see people pulling up and getting out of the car and taking uh, photos of themselves standing under the Bonnie Doon sign and sharing it, no doubt, with their friends on social media. So, look, it, it really has um, been a huge boon, if you like, for Bonnie Doon. So it's uh, it, it's something that um, the locals sometimes get a bit tired of uh, when you say you're from Bonnie Doon. And the first thing people say, well, how's the serenity? And, yeah, well, we've heard that one before many, many times, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but then there are those people, the, uh, the long-term locals, who uh, blame uh, Working Dog Productions, the people who made the film. They uh, hold them responsible for the millennium drought because uh, the film, as we say, was uh, made in 1997. At the end of 1997, the lake was dry for nearly 13 years. So <laughs> there are some people who blame Working Dog for that. <laughs> it is a remarkable legacy in more ways than one. And it had a pretty remarkable personal legacy for Michael as well, as we will hear a little bit later on. Paul, thank you for that insight. You'll be back later in the show. But for now, let's get on with episode one of series two. Staying strong. 
staying sharp and staying healthy with the Shed Wireless. Now in series one of the Shed Wireless, we had lots of laughs about the need to social distance from the fridge and how we hadn't walked further than the bathroom in three months and how the only muscle getting exercise was the bicep as we lifted a beer to our gobs. And depending on where in the world you are listening to this right now, that might still be your reality. Lockdowns are still in place in some parts of Australia and many parts of the world. But for many of you, you may be starting to think about resuming an exercise regime. Exercise can be tough when you do it regularly. It can be bloody torture if you haven't done it for a long time and try to get back into it. Tough physically, mentally, and practically. But when we've got a tough task, we call just one man. Stuart Torrance is ANSA's Men's Health Project Officer. Welcome to Series 2. How are you, sir? G'day, Aaron. How's life? Yeah, really good. How's your fitness going? Yes, no, no better than before. Um, we're, we're still working from home and I'm still working far too close to the fridge. One of the things that I have found over time uh, on a long exercise journey of life is that at least part of the motivation that keeps me going is I don't want to have to stop and start again. That thing of stopping and then having to get back into it is absolute torture really really no fun at all and yet because of covid that's going to be the reality for if not everyone a good percentage of people aaron for for most of us motivation is is the key it's it's um you know we go out and we buy the 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 sports uh shoes uh we buy the the kit we buy the lycra we buy the we buy the gym equipment i've got a, a massive big um you know weights machine downstairs that uh, is a great clothes horse. <laughs> yeah, here's a life pro tip for people. Never buy a treadmill <laughs> brand new because you can get a barely used secondhand one at a good price. <laughs> We've got council pickup in our area at the moment and I've seen at least three you can pick up for free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can build a whole gymnasium <laughs> from council but pickup. Do you know, Aaron, I think that the, the key here is, yes, motivation, but doing the little things. It's, it's those little steps, and I've, I've come up a, with a beauty uh, of an example that uh, aligns really well with our Spanner in the Works program. Do you want to hear it? Yes, please. It's called diff. We've got a diff, and it transfers the energy from the engine to the wheels, yes? Yes. Well, diff in our, our circumstance stands for distance, intensity, frequency, and fast. Okay, let's break those down point by point, can we? Yeah, no problem. So if we increase the distance of anything that we do, and I think I said this in the last series, Mm -hmm. if you park at the end of the the car park instead of at the shopping center door, that little bit of extra exercise is going to do you the world of good. Mm. Intensity. If, If you walk slowly currently, pick up the pace and increase the intensity just a little bit it will stand you in good stead. Frequency, do it more often. Now, my exercise for frequency is when I uh, unpack the dishwasher or when I'm you know, working in the garden. Instead of carrying six or seven things from one spot to another, I'll do that trip six or seven times yes. instead of in one, in one hit, increasing the frequency. And then increase the, the, the speed, the increasing the, the, the speed in which you do things, in which you go places, will stand you in good stead as well, I believe. So remember diff. What I like about that system is if you have had three or four months off, the prospect of pulling your now tight lycra shirt over your perhaps more substantial belly and going and ringing the gym and signing up at $60 a month Mm. and getting up in the cold of winter and heading in there, that can just be a bridge too far. But really, all that Diff is asking of us is, I guess, to switch on to the possibilities that are right under our nose. Is that fair analysis? Absolutely. Uh, Back in my younger days, I, I went to a gym and uh, they said, look, for the first couple of weeks, we'll give you a personal trainer. 
and I'm looking at all these magnificent looking machines and I'm going, wow, they look fantastic. I want to get my hands on those. Are you, to- are you talking about the personal trainer now or the rowing machine? <laughs> <laughs> it was all the machinery. All oh, right, right, machinery. the rowing machine. I'm with it, you. Good. It, Please continue. He was a big fella. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't get your hands on him. <laughs> in, in in that regard, I, you know, next thing he had me doing squats and sit ups and press ups, and I'm going, I want to go on the machines. He says, mate, if you can't lift your own body weight, mm. he says it's no good going to a machine. Mm. And I, I, it's it's something that st- uh, stayed with me through my life. If I'm unable to lift myself out of a chair, if I'm unable to balance, if I'm unable to um, roll myself out of bed in the morning, you know, these machines and all these fancy fandangle exercises and gym equipment are not going to do me any good whatsoever. So increasing the distance, intensity, frequency, and speed in which you do things will... Uh, be a, a good starting point for increasing our exercise regime. One thing that you mentioned there, the idea of a personal trainer, there is a school of thought that says, in many cases, a personal trainer isn't actually telling you very much that you don't already know. The power of a personal trainer is that it's an appointment to actually be somewhere. And if I have to rely on me to get up and go to the gym at five o'clock in the morning, that's one thing. If I'm meant to meet somebody, that's a completely different psychological head space. Yes. So, and I bear in mind that everything that we're saying here has to be mapped over the realities of COVID and social distancing and whatever else. But there is some value in trying to organize to do some exercise. And I might just be talking, walking around a park or walking down the shops or whatever else. But there is value in making an appointment with someone for exercise too, is there not? Absolutely. But then again, it doesn't need to cost us the world either. Talk talk to your grandchildren, talk to your kids uh, and say, look, I need some motivation. How about you chuck on the joggers and let's go out and do this together. It could be a a nice social connection exercise for for you and a loved one. A personal trainer doesn't necessarily need to to be an exercise physiologist or anything along those lines. It just needs to be somebody that's on your team, on your side, prepared to help you get motivated and do those little things that can stand us uh, in good stead. I uh, was thinking about when and where would be a good time to do a workout. What about in the ad breaks? (laughs) God knows you'll get about 20 minutes an hour. (laughs) (laughs) Depends which station you're on now. (laughs) True, true, true. The ABC doesn't have too many ad breaks. (laughs) No, but that's a great idea and it's an automatic reminder, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, you know, the the break in in, in whatever show you're watching comes on. You get up and you say, every time that that happens, I'm going to walk from the the lounge room into the kitchen and back as many times until the show goes back on. But just giving yourself that focus. And using diff, you can actually gamify it a bit. You know, if you get three done the first time you do it, you might get six done after three weeks. I'm going to make t-shirts with diff on them. That's a great idea. Is it, is it a seller? Do you, do you think <laughs> it's totally a seller? Out, out of the back of your spanner in the works truck, I can see you running a good illegal trade in t-shirts there. <laughs> Pull up at the local pub in the car park, selling them out the back. It's a good talking point as well. You wear one of those down to the pub and everyone will ask what diff is. So I think that's a terrific idea. And as you say, it maps beautifully over the broader concept of spanner in the works. It does. It, I think the point we're trying to get at, Aaron, here is the little things that count. They say 30 minutes of exercise, heavy, you know, heartbeat increasing exercise a day. But if you can't do 30 minutes of that kind of exercise every day, surely doing 10 minutes three times a day is better than doing nothing. Oh, 100%. In fact, doing three minutes if you're doing nothing is better. 30 is ideal, but anything is something. Diff is our takeaway. The ad break challenge is our takeaway. And can I just encourage everybody to head online to menshed.org, but also to check out the spanner in the works. I was mucking around on there the other day, and it is such a clever website, and it just 
frames our health, A, in a very accessible way, but B, it's such a clever analogy or metaphor of an engine and a car and it just really makes it all very comprehensible and it's quite user-friendly it's almost like playing a video game in a way so i thoroughly recommend it and diff will make more sense if you go along there as well thanks Stuart. top tips and good banter as always mate aaron good to talk to you take care that is Stuart torrance amsa's men's health project officer for our Shed in the Spotlight. First up, show and tell. Let's showcase a project or product from our Shed. Our show and tell segment is where we hear about a passion project or a product that the Sheds are working on and getting stuck right into. Now, very often that will probably be something like a beehive or a possum box or a bowls box, but it's a little bit different at the Raymond Terrace Men's Shed and Bob Bull is here to tell us all about it. G'day, Bob. Good morning, Aaron. Really nice to have you with us. What is the passion project of the Raymond Terrace Men's Shed right now? Well, a little different, as you say. We we certainly have lots of projects uh, working through the shed uh, through the year, but this is a little bit different to uh, what we, we would normally do, and it involves uh, uh, taking some of our members on a tour, uh, a regional tour around New South Wales, and uh, it's a, a concept that uh, we thought of some way back in early in, in 2020, uh, and someone made a, a bit of a throwaway comment with our music group that we have in our, our shed as to, well, why don't we go on tour sometime? And uh, we sort of dismissed that, but then thinking about it later, uh, I thought, well, yeah, that's, that's not a bad idea. What what can we do there? Uh, we've, got, we've got a good mu- music group, a large music group, and, uh, and we could easily set them up for a tour uh, arrangement. You often hear of tours from sheds where blokes uh, pile into a bus and go and visit another shed or some interesting local landmark or whatever, but you're actually going to come bearing the gift of music. Tell us a little bit about your your group. Yeah, so, uh, well, the music group in the shed's been operating for about five years now, and it's grown from uh, three or four up to about 20, 22, 23 members now in our music group. So it's a fairly large group. And uh, very varying experiences in the in the music knowledge, but some guys have been in the industry for a long time, uh, very experienced, and yet we have others that are, are learners, um, which I class myself in that, probably an experienced learner, you might say, <laughs> in some ways. We gather each week at our shed here and uh, do several hours of practice, and uh, for the music groups themselves, it's not just the shed that we do, do uh, some community events, uh, around the place, such as Australia Day and uh, even Bunnings, when they have some events down there, we, we get invited down there to play as well. But this is a little bit different. We we look back in January uh, when Australia was on fire, you might say, and then, of course, we run into um, floods and, and in the middle of a most severe drought. And I thought, well, look, these country guys, these regional towns are really suffering out there. What can we do to try and uh, lift their spirits a bit? Uh, and perhaps um, help them along the way. So, as I said, the suggestion was, why don't, why don't we go on tour? So I thought, well, that's not a bad idea. Let's let's contact some of the men's sheds in these regional towns and see if we can organise a, a concert tour overnight, just just on each town, one one town a night for a week, and uh, organise with them and uh, get some of them involved, get the sheds involved, and get their local community involved as well and given the challenges of covid what's the status of the tour right now yeah well that's thrown a spanner in the works uh we we, (laughs) in a lot of ways but we had had this organized for may of this year uh, and there's been a lot of work gone on behind it with count with the various uh, councils in the in the towns that we're going to visit and the men's sheds and uh, had it organized and then within just a couple of weeks before covid hit and of course we had to postpone the whole thing uh, and, and shut it down, but then we thought, well, we'll we'll ramp it. Things look like they're, they're being uh, improving on the COVID side, so we we might um, have a look at it, getting it going again, and we, we'd organise again for September this year. But now with the second wave uh, being a risk, uh, and it's too unpredictable that we've, we've now postponed it further, uh, probably until next year. The guys are keen to go on tour. They're even um, 
we, we are fundraising locally within our shed. The boys have even said, well, look, if, if we can't get it, we'll pay our own way to do this sort of thing. So uh, they've been very good about it. Fantastic. And obviously, given all the moving parts, you can't get too married to the idea of an itinerary. But do you have a rough idea where you were going to go or, or at least a, a dream scenario of where you'll go? No, yeah, we, it's more than a dream. We had planned it. Uh, we'd had all the men's sheds on site and, and we'd included... Uh, the towns that were suffering badly from the, the drought and and even the floods that were on. And, you know, places like Murundi, Manila, Baraba, Coonabarabran, Baradine and, and Gilgandra. Oh, what a great trip, huh? A fantastic trip. It got all the men's sheds on side that we were with and the councils uh, that were there and even uh, the school kids. Uh, we were inviting the schools in those in those little towns and we, and we sort of stayed with the, the small regional towns rather than the larger ones that have, more access to support. Uh, we thought maybe the smaller towns would um, appreciate it. Um, so we stayed with them and approached the schools and said, yeah, look, bring, bring uh, the school choir along and we can do a few numbers, uh, Australian songs with the, with the school kids. So it was well in the way of, of planning and arranged, and uh, then, of course, we've had to put a stop on it. Of course. So I'm sure it will happen in due course. We're, we're just about going to put the red pen through 2020, I think, at this point. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of style of music? You said you might do a few Aussie songs with the kids. Did you get as far as having a play set or a repertoire? A click Goes the Shears and um, Waltz and Matilda and, you know, songs that they're probably familiar with. But we we hadn't got to the point of pinning that down. Uh, that was the next level. Uh, we we didn't quite get to that. But as far as the the, the our music group ourselves, uh, the, the covers the covers music that we do, but pretty much across the board uh, type stuff with you know likes the Beach Boys and Creedence Clearwater or Elvis Presley and. Roy Orbison, you know, all the 60s, 70s, 80s songs that people are familiar with. I think I heard a bit of John Denver before we hooked up, did I? John Denver. John Denver's in there, yeah, that's that's for sure. Uh, and, and, of course, we can't miss Slim Dusty and James Blundell and those guys as well. <laughs> Excellent. 22 members, what sort of mix of instruments are involved there? Because it's kind of bigger than a band. Do you split up into different groups or are all 22 on stage? What's the experience like? No, uh, all, t- all 22 on stage. And, yes, it can be a little uh, difficult to control at times, but it <laughs> <laughs> depends what the day is. Depends how they're feeling on the day. <laughs> if, what, if the tambourine solo gets out of hand, for example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we'll, have, we'll try and sort that out. But, look, the uh, majority of guitars, of course, um, banjo, uh, drummer, keyboards, uh, and a few other minor instruments that are thrown in there at times as well. So whatever they they choose to play at the time. They're, they're a good group. They're a good group. They enjoy it. Which came first, the shed or the group? Was it just a happy accident that when you were all turning up to do a bit of woodwork, somebody mentioned they played the bass and someone else mentioned they played lead guitar? No, no, actually, it was at a, one of our general meetings. Someone uh, sort of stood up and said, look, how about why don't we get a, a music group going? Because we have other groups within our shed, other other interests in our shed as well. Of course. And one of them, uh, someone just stood up and said, look, why, why don't we get a, a music group going? And I was always interested in it. And I, I've got a musical background from, from when I was young and had to let it go for a long time. And I thought, well, that's good. I, I wouldn't mind picking my guitar up again. And then it just worked on from there after two of us. And then all of a sudden, out of the woodwork, uh, guys, that you, you just don't know what's talents are in some of your sheds around the place and then out of the woodwork we've got next thing we've got six and then eight and then ten and then someone says oh i know this guy down the street he plays he wouldn't mind sort of joining us so it's just grown from there and uh, and continued on and it's, it's getting to the point um we're running out of room so it's a combination of both you found some talent from existing shedders and then the fact that the group was up and running actually attracted new people as well that's right yes yeah, so they know someone else and uh they said, oh, well, even to the point where we've been out playing at a, at a function or, or a program somewhere and someone will come up and say, oh, you bloke's not too bad. I wouldn't mind sort of coming to your practice sessions. And, and from there on, it just flows on and uh, you pick up a few people from outside. They become members. They've, they've got to be a member of the shed, of course. Have you got a lead singer or have you got several of them? Several. <laughs> In fact, um, some everyone likes to have a go, um, but there are several uh, that are as I said before, they're, they're experienced um, musicians and they're quite good singers. 
Yeah. Uh, so everyone tries, to, out of practice, we all try to have a, a round of singing included in the day. Such a great project, and it's a real additional dimension to a shed, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, it's an extension of, of what sheds are about, and uh, it's so so good for uh, the mentality of, of the guys. I'm sure you've heard it before from other sheds have come in and and they're not feeling well, they're depressed, and then as soon as we get them into an activity and something to do, the, the improvement is quite remarkable. And how's everyone come through the COVID experience so far, with fingers crossed that we have in fact come through? Yeah, well, we've been okay. Uh, none of our members that I'm aware of have, have contracted it or, or had any symptoms of it. Of course, they're getting their testing done and we're doing our testing in the shed now as they come in to try and keep on top of things. But so far, fortunately, uh, we've, we've um, stayed away from it. And the area that we in here, Roman Terrace, have been very fortunate. There's nothing been too severe around here either. If there's someone listening elsewhere in Australia and they might have scratched around one or two blokes with a musical background, do you have any advice on how to pull all of this together and bring it to reality? If you've got someone that's got some experience with it and that want to do it, by all means, uh, go ahead because it's it's one of the best things that you, you'll find uh, uh, you can get involved with. Now, having said that our guys are in the music, and a lot of them only come to the shed for that reason. They're not particularly interested in doing woodwork or metalwork or, or much else in the shed, but they, they are interested in music and they might just turn up for that. But by all means, if there's someone a shed wanting to do it and they've got a couple of players, Go on with it because you'll find you'll get support, particularly if um, out in the community know that there is a group there uh, and you'll often find, oh, gee, I, I played years ago and I'd like to come back in again. And if you've got a leader, you need a leader for your group uh, that can organise your songs and, um, and that's the way to do it because I know there are music groups in other sheds around the place. I know I was up at Mount Gravatt a while back there and I just happened to land there on the day that they had their music group going as well. And they had a reasonable size um, uh, area there that, that they were using and it sounded quite good. So there are other sheds that, are, that they use this sort of interest. And uh, if there is anyone else that wants to do it, by all means, go for it. And you'd be happy to take an email from someone if they were interested in getting something off the ground? Absolutely. If, if um, they wanted to a hand with it, uh, we could supply them and, and sort of give them an idea, a list of, of songs that we play, which are not hard. Uh, generally, um, they're all corded music, and um, with a couple of the players that are lead players, they can work out their own style of things. Uh, but I'm quite prepared to help them along with it if they uh, need some ad- uh, guidance on or some advice. Well, get in touch with us here at the Shed Wireless, and we'll put you in touch with Bob if you find yourself in that situation. Bob, it's fantastic, and as I say, all of the things that the sheds do well would only be more true when there was music involved, I imagine. So hopefully not only the regional New South Wales tour happens, but we might organise the world tour before we're done. Goodness knows you'll have had plenty of practice by the time we get this thing happening. 2020 is a write-off, but I hope that 2021 embraces the concept and it comes to full fruition. Thanks for telling us all about it today, Bob. Very welcome, Aaron. Thank you. Good on you, Bob Bull there from the Raymond Terrace Men's Shed talking about uh, their musical tour that is postponed, but the passion remains and it is our show and tell project for this episode. Shedder in the Spotlight. Let's meet and learn about the life of one of our shedders. So Shedder in the Spotlight is our chance to learn about the life of a Shedder and our special guest from the Raymond Terrace Men's Shed is Ray Gray. G'day, Ray. Hi. What's your story? Uh, Well, my story is back in 2006, I had a stroke. I was uh, brought into the first shed we had here uh, back in 2012 by one of our first members. They sort of looked after me for the first few years, and then I sort of became adopted by everyone at the shed. Since then, I've uh, become part of the uh, community. Let's just rewind a little further. I detect an accent, so you weren't always in Raymond Terrace. No, no. I I started in Canada. That's where I was born, and and, uh, I grew up. I actually moved over here when I was 39, 
And uh, it was actually just a couple of months after that that I had my scope, so I had it over here. So that explains why you didn't necessarily have a big social group around you. Exactly. Why did you come here? Oh, no, no. I originally came to Australia because uh, it just seemed like a a good time. Uh, My son was four years old, and it just seemed like it was a, a good time that if we wanted to experience somewhere else, this would be a, that would be a good time to bring them over. And not only that, uh, the vice president here and his wife happened to be my in-laws. And so it was a, a good uh, chance to come over here, being Australia and actually Madawi, to be able to uh, spend some time with them. In that time, I've actually made my uh, uh, father-in-law come over here and become part of the shed himself. Did you have a job prior to the stroke? Because you were quite a young man, right? Yes, I was 39 at the time. And I'd spent a little over 20 years working in uh, industrial control. So the uh, the electronics and control systems you'd find uh, in things like the mills and factories and the, mil- and the uh, mines and such, uh, as well as uh, some time in a uh, job where I was making technology uh, as simple to use as possible. So it was, it was a lot of high-level cognitive stuff that was going on. So did the stroke come as a complete bolt from the blue? Uh, yes, to a certain extent. Uh, my paternal grandmother had the same uh, thing. It was actually a very, a very uh, massive one, and she had the same thing, and it actually took out more than two-thirds of my right side of my brain. My brain. And uh, I also found that myself uh, with uh, very limited use of my left side, in fact, no use of my left arm, this place has been good for me too, this place being the shed, in that there's people that can uh, do the stuff that isn't uh, very uh, safe for me to do. Can you just take me to the moment of the stroke? What actually happened? I went to bed that night and I found myself on the floor, apparently, and I, my my wife came into the into the room and saw me down there with doing having a bit of a uh, epileptic fit, so we had to uh, call the ambulance. There. A lot of the, the other things in that at that time I don't actually know. I basically have to go based off what people give me because my memory was definitely affected by this. I can imagine. So then you more or less get your senses back in hospital, and what sort of function had you lost? You mentioned your arm, but what was your new reality? My re- new reality is that I could not speak. Well, at the time, I couldn't sp- uh, couldn't speak at all. Uh, I had no use of my, my leg either. I also still have uh, only half my eyesight. I don't have any left side peripheral vision and as well uh, some cognitive problems as well. So. I found myself basically isolated, not only from a point of view of the active things that I could do, but also cognitively, communication. It's something called aphasia, which is a problem that a lot of stroke victims have where you have problems communicating. Can I just state for the record that you're doing a brilliant job right now? It's absolutely remarkable, your recovery, and we'll get to that. But at that point, you're... A bloke who hasn't had his 40th birthday, you've got a young child at home and you've lost all of this function, including the ability to speak. It must have been terrifying, mate. From what I can remember myself, uh, it was very terrifying. In fact, actually, uh, I was in the hospital for four months and after that, when I was sort of uh, uh, conscious of what was happening to me, uh, it was very, very terrifying in some uh, ways. What happened with the return of your ability to speak? How did you get that back? Well, first off, it came through of uh, being able to uh, to swallow first. I couldn't swallow regular food, and uh, I was able to eventually tell people I'd like to see my son. And so at that point, it was actually see David or some phrases here and there. From there, I uh, just, I guess, improved from uh, day to day. It was just a very slow process, being that I did lose so much uh, function. You gave us some sense of it before, but what do you remember of that process? Presumably, you were at home, your recovery was well underway, but you were feeling that social isolation, you were 
really treading this path alone. How did the shed come into your life? Uh, well, there's a, a couple of family friends who uh, knew that I had been active in things like woodwork uh, before the stroke. And so they thought, oh, it would be a good opportunity for me to, to go back um, into an uh, environment that I did know back before the stroke. And so they took me to the first few uh, meetings, and then uh, eventually I got to the point where the men's shed was actually up and running. And so then they took me into the uh, into the shed as, as uh, much as they could and looked after me. And then after a few years, or actually I guess as a few years went by, the place actually, what could only be called, adopted me and uh, were taking care of me from doing the things that I couldn't do or uh, would not be safe for me to do. And also just uh, getting a lot of mateship back. So that, uh, because I had a very, I had a very isolated life at that point, it was now a, a place where I could go and uh, feel like one of the blokes. Where would you be without it, right? Uh, well, I think I'd still be very isolated. My communication skills would not be there at all. Uh, I mean, when I started going in, I felt very uh, self-conscious of what I uh, what I could say and and uh, understand. And I think that would still be the case if it wasn't for this place. One of the things about men, and I'm talking in broad brushes here, but we don't like to be an imposition, you know, we like to be on top of our game all the time. Were you struck by the generosity of the men? Oh, yes. Uh, not only in, in time, but in taking into account my condition and you know, starting to include me into conversations and things that were happening as I could, uh, as I could actually comprehend them a little bit more. What's day-to-day -day quality of life like for you now? Oh, great. And uh, I'm able to have a conversation like we are now. I'm able to do what I can with the uh, use of the one part of, or the one side of my, my body. I can do a lot more physical things with my son. I'm not at a point where I can go very physical in a lot of the stuff, but I can be there in those situations with him. Spend some time with my, my wife and son outside doing things, things like here, I can actually take, get a lot of that, that uh, thinking skills and, and doing things too, which you know, I was at a point where I couldn't do anything. And so it's, it's, it's good that I can say that I'm doing things that not only are good from a physical point of view, but also from getting that uh, free matter to still be uh, taxed and still, still used, which actually the use of the of the brain. If you don't use it, you lose it. Well, it's it's good that I can do, use what I still have left. You sound genuinely happy, Ray. Oh, definitely. As I've said, you know, uh, coming to this place is a place that I was then getting the the mateship and getting the the uh, fellows helping with my recovery. Well, I don't know what it says about your stroke and your recovery and the state of the rest of us, but this may be the most articulate conversation I've had in a long time, mate. So <laughs> oh, thank you. It's an absolute credit to you. You should take a bow. It's been a pleasure to meet you and hear your story, one that could have ended in tragedy, but with the Sheds playing a role, has ended in fulfilment and happiness. Thanks for being our Shedder in the Spotlight, mate. No problem. Thank you. Ray Gray, Shedder in the Spotlight at the Raymond Terrace Men's Shed. Shed Story. Let's find out more about our shed in the spotlight. Every shed has a story. Every shed is a story. And to tell us the story of the Raymond Terrace Men's Shed, we have Treasurer and Shed Manager, Frank Saysner. G'day, Frank. G'day, Aaron. How are we? Yeah, great, thank you. In telling the Raymond Terrace Men's Shed story, it's pretty helpful to start with your personal story because they're pretty closely intertwined. My wife and myself did a trip up north 
And on the way, we uh, crawl in some uh, men's sheds on the way. And uh, all I want to do is just check them out because I heard about the uh, men's shed movement and I thought, what a great concept it is. And uh, I thought, well, I'd like to uh, just uh, have a look and see what they're all about. So when I got back home again, I said to my wife, well, this is what, this is what we've got to have in Roman Terrace, a men's shed. So I was working in my, uh, in my garage making toys for my grandkids at that time, but now I make toys at home for the shed because I don't get time to do them here in the shed because being treasurer and shed manager uh, takes up all my time here in the mornings. So uh, I, was, I was working in my shed and I heard on the radio that they were talking about starting a, having a meeting to start uh, a men's shed here in Roma Terrace. My ears pricked and I thought, ah, that's where I've got to go to this meeting to find out what it's all about. So I went to this meeting. As it was, uh, they had a, a representative from the Australian Men's Shed Association uh, in the name of uh, Stuart Torrance to, to uh, give us a verge on uh, what uh, men's sheds were about. And uh, after that meeting, the three of us got together, uh, Bob Bull, who had spoke a while ago, Graham Berthold and myself, and we thought, what a great idea. This is something we need to do in Roman Terrace. So uh, we discussed a few things and we thought, well, how are we going to go about it? How are we going to find out what it's all about? Uh, I knew there was a, an uh, Australian Men's Head Association. We could approach them and get the information from them. But uh, as it was, we uh, went to a uh, cluster meeting in Belmont. There we spoke to a lot of the guys from different sheds and uh, they informed us what sheds were all about and how to uh, to get started. So then we got into Australian Men's Heads Association. They gave us a spill on what to do from there. So uh, that's that's how I actually uh, I got involved with it initially. How did you get the actual shed, the location? And once the uh, steering committee was formed, then we went out and started looking for places to, uh, to start a men's shed. Council gave us some uh, ideas where we looked around, uh, but right from the beginning, our idea was to start a men's shed or have a men's shed here in Boomerang Park. Uh, a lot of the other places that they showed us were uh, not suitable or too far away where Boomerang Park was central in Roman Terrace. As it went on, we, uh, we heard that the fire station was available, only being a small building, there wasn't a lot much room in it. Uh, we thought, well, that, 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 that'll that be a start anyway. So we, we grabbed it, started working on it. We uh, painted it, uh, put electrical work into it, tied it all up. And then we thought, well, this is not big enough for a shed. It's only a, a large garage. So we got some money together and decided that we uh, put some warnings outside so we can work outside as well. So we were, we were in there for uh, about five years. I imagine being out there under the awning on a cold winter's day with the wind blowing in sideways kept everyone focused on getting better premises, did it? It was, that's for sure, yeah. <laughs> that the, the the idea was that we had to get out of this uh, fire station. We need to get something a bit bigger and something a bit more comfortable. <laughs> and you certainly have. You've got a Rolls Royce now, haven't you? Oh, we've got a magnificent building here now. Give us some sense of it. The size of it, it's, well, it's... Uh, 40 metres by 20 metres. We have a large a woodworking area. One side of the woodworking area is all machinery. The other side is all preparation work. Then we have a section at the back of the, the shed, which is all metal work. Uh, outside the back of the shed, we also have more sheds. We put up uh, four demountable sheds, one to carry our kindling that we do. We uh, do a lot of kindling. The other is for the wood turners. Uh, they've got all timber in there drying out for their wood turning. And uh, the other one is uh, a garden shed for our gardening group. We have a fantastic gardening group here. We've got market, market, like a market garden out the side of, of our shed with different uh, pods of different vegetables in them. And then at the uh, the front end of the shed, we have our, our office, uh, our lunchroom, toilet blocks, and then a large uh, recreation area, uh, which also has a computer room in, which I'm in at the moment, which, where we teach the guys how to use computers, and also a sick bay area. So uh, it's, it's a fairly large, large area. Come a long way from the awnings. We have, we have, most certainly. I'm interested, Frank, in the mix of men at the shed because Raymond Terrace is an interesting place for those people who aren't aware. There's the council administration centre there, but it's an agricultural area. It was once a strong dairying area. There's a major RAAF base nearby. Where are you drawing your men from and what are their backgrounds? Uh, well, we have backgrounds from all, all different type of people here. You know, uh, I, I'm an ex uh, 
uh, pastry cook and baker. Then I went uh, uh, as well with a car accident, so I had to, unfortunately, uh, my business went uh, bust, so I uh, went into uh, painting. Toy making is my hobby. Uh, we have doctors here, policemen, lawyers, general public, people without any experience that come in and say, well, listen, I'd li like to do something. I'm sick of sitting around the house doing nothing. They come here and we say, well, what, 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 what would you like to do? Oh, I'd like to make toys. I say, okay, well, Tuesday is our toy making day. Come in on Tuesday and we'll show you how to make toys. And in terms of the various projects, obviously there's woodworking going on with the toy making. We've heard about the band and the amazing work that they do, or the music group more properly, as it's called. It's too, too big to be a band. What other sort of activities and projects are underway there? Well, uh, we're, we're doing an, uh, a big project at the moment for uh, St Vincent de Paul. Uh, they've got their uh, big uh, collection bins. Uh, which used to be, uh, were, were built by a uh, jail somewhere in Goulburn. Uh, unfortunately, that, that has fallen through, uh, so they can't get the new bins built now. So they're bringing the old bins to us and we're repairing. They're all rusty and, and falling apart and we just rebuild and repaint them and put new labels on them. That's one project we do. We do a lot of community work, uh, just about in the process of putting a fence up out at Hinton or a memorial down there. So... Uh, we do that type of work. We have people coming in with different jobs they want done and uh, we uh, we just repair chairs and things like that. Also, people see things on the internet and say, come in and say, can you make that for me? I said, will you give me a photo, give me the measurements and we'll quote it and uh, we'll do it for you. And plus our toy, toy, toy making is a big part of our, our shed. Yeah, let's talk a bit about that. If I lob in with no real experience and say, hey, I'm interested in making toys for my grandkids, what would you likely tip me into? Well, we'll start you with a basic toy, a little, little, little cut-out square, a, toy, a car rather, with, with and put some holes in, put a couple of wheels on it, and uh, we'll start you with that. Then we just progress to to uh, the larger toys. We've got one guys here that make toys that have got hydraulics and everything on them. Just uh, as, as far as the shed sales go, we had an, uh, a toy sale here three weeks ago. Over the COVID period, we, uh, we're, we were still making toys at home. There's about four of us still making toys at home. We were inundated with toys. We had that much stock. We thought, well, we've got to start getting rid of it. So we put an ad in the paper and uh, said, well, we're having this sale on, on a Saturday morning. Uh, we had one person come in and bought a $90 uh, toy. So I thought, I'll, I'll, run, I'll run an ad again, we'll try again. Uh, nobody turned up. So I said to the guys, no, this is no good. So I said, what about we put on Facebook and Marketplace? Then the following mm -hmm. Saturday, people just come from everywhere. We sold $3,500 worth of toys in three hours. Mm -hmm. And they come from Musselbrook, Cessna, Singleton, Central Coast, Newcastle. They come from everywhere. And then we had to get another one last Saturday and sold another $1,800 worth of toys. So... That's where, our, that's where our main income is from uh, toy sale. You've got good numbers there. You've got good variety. You've got a lot of interesting projects going on. You have a great location and you all worked hard to make that happen. Clearly, by any measure, you're a successful shed. What advice would you give other sheds and shedders across the country about holding together a shed, progressing it and keeping so many blokes happy and satisfied and engaged? Well, as shed manager, I, uh, I, I like to help the guys in whatever they want to do. Uh, you know, as far as the shed goes, you can come and do as much as you want or as little as you want. There's no, no pressure on anybody. If the work's there, if somebody comes in and says, I'd like to do something, I give them a job, they do it and they're happy. As far, far mm. as uh, what type of work they want uh, to do, that's up to them. Uh, I, give, I, I say, well, you listen, this job's available. You can do this job. If you want to do it, go ahead. If you don't, well, I'll get somebody else. And uh, I, I think it's just uh, no pressure on anybody. They come, they go. They can do as little as they want. And uh, I, I think that's the concept of the shed. I don't think we should uh, pressure guys into doing what they uh, don't want to do or not sure that they can do. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, all the guys here are happy with what they're doing and uh, that's fine. 
in a lot of communities across Australia, the sheds are right at the heart of it, but there's nowhere where that's any more true than in Raymond Terrace. You guys are, are almost local celebrities in that part of the world, and the shed is just going gangbusters. Looking forward to seeing all of your projects come to fruition and might even swing by and grab some toys before Christmas myself. Thank you very much for telling us the shed story, Frank. Okay, Aaron, thank you too. Good on you. That is Treasurer and Shed Manager at Raymond Terrace Men's Shed, Frank Saisner. Would you like to put your shed in the spotlight? Just contact us via email, theshedwireless at mensshed.net, and we'll take care of the rest. Now, as we learned in Series 1 of The Shed Wireless, when AMSA Chairman Paul Sladden talked about his interesting life, he was elected the Mayor of Bonnie Doon, the place immortalised in the iconic Australian movie The Castle as the ultimate working-class holiday destination, largely because of the serenity. To be honest, it's a bit more complicated than that, because Bonnie Doon itself doesn't have a mayor, it's part of the Mansfield Shire. But what is true is that Paul is their councillor, and the home that featured in the castle is just across the water from his place. It is indeed a small world, because one of the stars of the castle, Michael Caton, is also a friend of the Men's Shed movement, having lent his unmistakably Australian voice to an Australian Men's Shed Association community service announcement. He is also, of course, the Australian actor who has had perhaps more roles in more unforgettable Australian television than anyone else, from Skippy to the Sullivans, Homicide and Division 4 to the Thornbirds, Pack to the Rafters to Dancing with the Stars, A Country Practice and All Saints. And he's been good enough to join us here on the Shed Wireless. Welcome, Michael. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's good to be here. When I go through that list like that and I say Skippy and Homicide Division 4, Country Practice, does like a memory of each of those flash in your head as I say it? Yes, especially Skippy. <laughs> yeah, tell me that. How did you come to be on Skippy? You must have been a pup then, were you? I was. I was just fresh to, uh, to Sydney from, from uh, uh, Brisbane. And myself and Rona McLeod were supposed to be terrorised by this wild bull, which was the most docile animal you've ever seen. There was no way that bull was going to do anything. So it, it, it always sticks in my mind as a very funny day. Do you feel like you have been part of the thread of the Australian television and movie industry? Or... Does it just seem like a job like any other to you? I, I suppose I, I came in in the shadow of some great actors as well, you know. Um, I was I was the new kid on the block and you still had your Chips Rafferty's and Bud Tingwells and Leonard Teal's. Mm. So I, I sort of feel that I, I was there, but pretty well after the beginning, I would suggest. You only did 12 episodes of The Sullivans, is that right? That's what I researched and found out. <laughs> oh, no. It's, it isn't, right? You did more than that. Oh, God, yes. I thought yes. so. I was like, because that's almost what you're most famous for. Are you more recognised for that or Daryl Kerrigan from The Castle? It depends how old you are. Right, I see. Although, you know, with The, uh, with the Sullivans, uh, it's been shown three times. So there are different generations who have actually seen it. So <laughs> it, it's uh, there was the initial one, which was which was amazing. Uh, I was totally unprepared for fame. I'd always thought that that won't it be wonderful to be famous. Then fame happens to you, and it's not quite so wonderful. Uh, elaborate on that. Why is fame not all it's cracked up to be? Look. Uh, at times, fame is wonderful. You know, sort of it opens doors, but at other times, it sort of inhibits you a bit. I, I was much more outgoing and and a bit of a yahoo prior to fame, and I, I found out I had to put my head down a bit and and, uh, and cancel some of my previous behaviour. Because you're in a fishbowl? Yeah, yeah, especially in Melbourne. Yeah. In Melbourne, it... 
42% of television sets were turned on to the Sullivans. Yeah. And I still go uh, in Melbourne, get much more recognition than I do here in Bondi. What is it about the Sullivans that you think connected with Australians? Why did four out of ten people turn that show on, do you think? Well, I think it was that it was this sort of ideal family. Mm. And it, it was uh, it was very popular, if, if you'd believe this, among homeless kids. Mm. I remember hearing one of the producers say, they get to a, a television set somehow and they're watching it. But it, it sort of everybody watched it. it, it and it was a, a very cleverly designed show, sort of catered to all the different age groups. It was, the production values were very high. Even though we were doing two hours of television a week, it was, uh, the, the, the values of it were very high. Mm. And everyone really cared about it. Is that the same magic that made the castle work? The idea that it captured the family dynamic? Oh, the castle was a phenomenon. There's lightning in a bottle, right? It was just, a, it was such a beautiful script. Everyone in it was just perfect. And it's interesting to talk about the castle, actually. Because mm. uh, the, uh, talking about the men's shed, mm. is that that came a year after uh, I'd been in a deep depression. And so I, I got myself off to a psychiatrist and, and worked through it, behaved myself. And really when the, the, the castle happened, and it happened quite by accident, I was actually a last minute choice. Uh, I was totally ready for it because I'd done all the, all the work on myself in that previous 12 months. Explain what you mean by that. What was the work that you did that made you ready for that role? It, it was simply getting my state of mind uh, back to where it should have been. I see. It's extraordinary, the castle. It only made a bit over $10 million, and yet so many people can quote chapter and verse. It has entered the vernacular in a way that very few other things ever have, and yet it was quite a small, discreet, low-budget and fast-shot movie, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. It was shot it in, uh, I think it was ten and a half days. <laughs> Mind-boggling. We only, we'd only do a couple of takes on each scene and we'd do two cameras so that we didn't have to then come around and do reverses, which I loved because the timing of the scene... Uh, basically became the timing of the actors rather than the timing of the editor. I wonder if that gives it some of its authentic feel as well. Yeah, well, it was, it was like a live performance. A question I've always wanted to ask somebody who has had a career like yours, is it true that you once a week go to a mailbox and pick up a royalty check. So do you still make money from the castle and the Sullivans? No. It doesn't work like that? No, very little. I got very little of it overseas. I suppose the best has been, I'd like to give a big cheerio call to Channel 9 because they show it twice a year. So every every couple of years I get a check. But we actually did the, the castle for equity minimum. I'm not whinging about that a bit because it took me from being dead in the water to having a really renewed career. So I, I am forever grateful uh, to the castle. So you're about to turn 77, as I understand it. Is that right? Yes. There are many men listening right now who would look at somebody like you and say, well, of course, I'm struggling in my 70s because my life was something. Now I'm retired. I'm trying to stay interested. I'm trying not to be socially isolated. But I imagine things are just magical for someone like Michael Caton. He's a big star and he's done amazing things with his life. How does depression grab somebody like you? Well, it was very interesting because I had some friends over the other day and they're a little younger than me, both sort of uh, immunity compromised a bit. I said, hey, you guys, have you been experiencing a sort of low-grade depression? 
And they both said yes. And, and I'm not saying it was any big thing, but it's just there lurking because, because of your age, because I'm an asthmatic, because I've been a heavy smoker in the past. Uh, I know that I'm, I'm under the gun a bit. So it just hovers there around you. And, I, and when you think about the men's shed, it, it must be uh, for, for people who take that support and camaraderie uh, from it, must be feeling a bit isolated themselves. That's uh, those things that they do to get themselves in good order aren't available. I take it that's the case, Aaron, is it? Oh, unquestionably so. And and might I say that the very existence of the shed wireless is an attempt to virtually plug that gap to give a sense of some of the things that happen in the shed within the physical restraints that we're all operating under. COVID has snatched away a lot of the things we took for granted, hasn't it? Yes, it has. It has. I mean, I'm I'm sort of... I've got to make a, uh, a trip up to Bondi Junction after we finish talking and the mask will go on and the hand sanitizer will get clipped to the belt because uh, I've got to drop in my, because I'm over 75, I have to have a health uh, check every year for my license and so I'll, I'll have to go up to the, the registry office and, and, and put in my, my medical and and get a bit of business done and then sanitize my hands and get back in the car and away we go again you know sort of back home you know we have we have been out but uh it's a, a very rare thing and it's usually somewhere where we can dine outdoors and that's about it as somebody who has been an actor and had to take on the personas of many different characters and as somebody who now has 77 years of life experience, including plenty of highs and plenty of lows, what's it all add up to as you reflect on life and try and make sense of the human condition? Have you got any answers? Look, uh, I, I have had a very interesting life. I wasn't always an actor. I started working for wool brokers when I left school and then I got a job with uh, Sydney Williams, the, the Comet Windmill people. And I was doing a little bit of acting at amateur theatre with some really good people. And then I was asked to do this, uh, to do a, a professional job. Uh, I said, oh, OK, and I kept the job going for a while. And, and then I... I'm going to sleep at work. I think, well, you can't keep this up forever. So I made that big uh, step of of becoming a, 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 prof- a professional actor. A very career on stage and then the Sullivans happens and then you ride that wave and then you become a bit like the old couch on the, in the corner because you've been around for so long. Uh, and I'm I'm not the handsome leading man type of person then all of a sudden after 12 years 12 months of unemployment and a bit of therapy along comes the castle and it's sort of it's just been an amazing ride i feel sort of terribly privileged uh, to have the life i've had Mm. and i've got no regrets my life took me to places i never thought it would it's nice to get to 77 and be able to say that yeah, and I've tried to do other things as well. I mean, I'm very concerned, you know, uh, politically uh, about the way that uh, we're just abusing our water. You know, people want to drill down through water tables in, in some of the best agricultural land in the world to get, get gas out where the science is not there to, to get it out safely. So, I mean, I, I try and do as much as I can in that area. And I mean, the Murray-Darling Basin is a disgrace. It's a disgrace. We're, we're draining it, just using it like a, like a sump, where we've really got to cherish it because it's the backbone of the, of the eastern states. 
that leads us beautifully to one more really big question that I wanted to ask you that I like to ask of many of our guests. If you had the power to change anything, and interpret this however you want, if you had the power to change anything but just one thing, what would it be? Oh, fix, fix. Um, look, I, I suppose it's the way we take this planet for granted and it's, it's a f really finite, delicate thing. I mean, I always remember the astronauts uh, sort of coming back from the moon and seeing how thin the atmosphere of the, of, of the world really is and we seem determined to dig everything up in a couple of generations and and if if i could do anything i, I would i would i would love to make people aware and be active about saving the long term future of our planet you know because i've had a great run I was a year too old for Vietnam. I've come through a time where medical science and all that stuff has kept us alive a lot longer than we used to. But at the same time, what are we going to leave the, the next generations? Unless we really change our thinking really quickly, you know, I'm okay. But, but really, sort of, uh, a lot of people in industry and mining it's just all about profit. It's not about anything else. It's like the, the Murray Darling and, and irrigators who, who aren't farmers uh, buying and selling water, which will become the most precious resource on the planet. Much ahead of coal, I'm here to tell you. You know, water is what it's about. And so I, I would like people, I'll, I'll put it in a nutshell. I would like people east of the Great Divide to become much more aware of what's going on west of the Great Divide because that is what is really important. My family came from central Queensland and they depend totally on the artesian and sub-artesian basins and we're about to build a big mine that'll go straight down through the sub-artesian basin, which all the farmers in that area, that's where, how they water their cattle. That is an eloquent and considered answer. Thank you very much. One last thing before I let you go. If the castle actually only made $10 million, Bonnie Doon itself has probably made more in tourism than the actual <laughs> film itself made. And, and Bonnie Doon is the poor end. When I first arrived in Melbourne, the eastern end of, of Lake Heald was the posh end with all the houseboats and water skiing, and, and Bonnie Doon wasn't that posh end. <laughs> How good to see them get a bit of a boost, eh? Absolutely. That leads to my question. How many times have you been to Bonnie Doon other than for shooting the castle? Look, I've driven through Bonnie Doon because there's a wonderful drive. If you turn off the Hume Highway and uh, come in through sort of Yak and Dander and uh, you come through Bonnie Doon. And I've done that drive quite a few times because just north of uh, Healesville is Black Spur which is a, a wonderful, uh, it's Mount Nash, straight as a die for, for uh, hundreds of feet. And uh, with all ferns, and God knows what growing at the base of them. And it, and it was destroyed in 1939 by a huge bushfire, which we actually uh, played that bushfire in the Sullivans, actually. Oh. It's, it's regrowth. But uh, once upon a time, I, I took a uh, turn off the track and I drove up this track and there sitting there was a stump and it had to be about 17 or 18 feet in diameter 
and that was left from that original 1939 forest. So that's time for you. That's time. Isn't it? Thank you for giving us a little bit of your time. In all sincerity, your life uh, was in many ways uh, the the subtext of young man like me growing up in rural and regional Australia and to have the chance to... Where did you grow up, mate? In Patterson, so in the Hunter Valley. Oh, lucky you. It's easy for people to forget now with the internet and uh, a million pay television channels, Netflix and all of that, but really we were fed only a couple of tubes of, if you're in rural and regional Australia in the 70s and 80s, people like you were how we understand the world to be. And so to have all these years on the opportunity to talk to you has been an enormous thrill and you've been incredibly generous to the Men's Shed movement and to AMSA more specifically. So thank you. Uh, My pleasure, mate. My pleasure. Look after yourself. Keep that mask on and please stay safe. We need another 15 or 20 years out of you, yeah? Well, I've got to to go back in September and finish the first season of Back to the Rafters, which we we had to sort of wrap up about, uh, you know, three months ago. Yeah. So we've, we've got to go back and finish it. At least... It will get me out of the house. <laughs> it will indeed. At least I, I, I could be maybe socially distanced, being able to see some of my mates from the industry again. We can't wait to see you back on our screens. Stay safe in the interim and thank you so much for your generosity to the Shed Wireless. Well, keep an eye out on the 27th of August too because we've had a film that I did with uh, Sam Neill about 80 months ago. We had to cancel the opening of it but they're going to open it on August the 27th. That is if we don't have another lockdown. It's called Rams, about two brothers who breed rams. They live right next door to each other and they haven't spoken in 40 years. That sounds (laughs) fed. And it's you and Sam Neill being the brothers. Yeah, yeah. Magic, magic. Thank you once again. Look after yourself and I hope we have occasion to talk again soon. If not, you can guarantee uh, we'll be watching you on the screen. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Aaron. Go well. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. (laughs) Nailed it with Rick Woodchip. G'day, Shadows, Rip Woodchip here. How are you all going today? I'm just sitting here playing with my pedometer. No, that's not some euphemism, you dirty-minded buggers. No, it's one of those thingies that measures your steps, you know? The doc gave it to me the other day to help me keep track of how much exercise I'm doing. They reckon 10,000 steps a day is the daily recommendation. I reckon if I had this thing when I was still working on the farm, I would have blown it off the bloody Richter scale. You hear all these people banging on at the moment about whacking on the kilos during isolation and blaming it all on the fact that they couldn't get to the gym. Bit of a crock, I reckon. I mean, going to the gym and all that stuff is all well and good, but what all these young'uns don't understand is it's not the be-all and end-all. We had this fitness regime when I was a kid, and I still use it to this day. It's called Get Up and Bloody Move. The doc had a different name for it. NEAT. Non-Exercise Activity Thermojet. Thermogenesis, I don't know, some bloody thing. It's basically one of them fancy terms that means all the energy we burn up when we're not either sleeping, eating, or playing sport. Basically, just living. But not sitting on the couch type living. Getting out there and actually doing stuff, you know? I know we all go through these little periods where we get a little slack. And in one of those stages there, the only exercise I was doing was walking to the fridge and getting another beer. And the most strenuous thing I was doing during the day was dropping off the kids at the pool of a morning. But with some kindly encouragement from the missus, I gave myself a bit of a reboot and just got active again. It ain't rocket surgery. You don't necessarily need to be lifting the weight of a small vehicle over your head or sweating like you're pushing out a kidney stone to make a difference. You just gotta move. As the boy who was fiddling the ocean said, every little bit helps. And even just your everyday daily activity can add up to a decent workout. I don't need to spend a million bucks on some newfangled gadget off the home shopping network when I have a shovel or a mop and two legs and a heartbeat. And I'm also making use of myself while I'm at it. I think they call that work. You just gotta look at things with a bit of a different perspective and give it a little more thought. For example, 
I've got this neighbour, and he must go to the gym five times a week, and then he pays someone else to mow his lawn. Where's the bloody sense in that? The missus and I are all over it. We're always helping each other out to keep active. You could call her my little gym buddy. She does her stretches every morning when she's picking up my dirty laundry that I strategically place around the bedroom floor. And she very thoughtfully has me wash her car on a weekly basis. And we even work out together sometimes. The Zumba class in the bedroom last night was particularly intense. Quick, but intense. But you guys get what I mean. You don't need a diploma in exerciseology to know that what's good for you. It's just putting it into practice. Like taking the stairs instead of the elevator. Parking a little further away from the shops. They even reckon just fidgeting counts. Or you might even mow your lawn, for Pete's sake. It all counts. Basically, if you're not sleeping, just keep moving. Well, Shedders, I've only got 9,999 more steps to reach my daily goal. So I'd better get to it. Good to talk to you, fellas. All right, catch you next week. Bye. Got a question? Ask the doc, Professor Rob McLaughlin from AMSA Partners Healthy Mail. This is a new segment where we give you the opportunity to ask a real doctor a men's health question. It might be something you've always just been curious about. It might be something that you're experiencing right now. It might be something you aren't quite sure how to frame with your own doctor and would like a little bit of background. We want to hear from you, and you're most welcome to go by a nickname or a non de plume. Your privacy will be fully respected, but please send us a question that you would like us to discuss here to the shed wireless at menshed.net. That's the same email for all correspondence with the show, the shed wireless at menshed.net. Now, the doctor we have at your disposal is a bit special. I promise I won't give him his full title very often, but it is worth hearing at least once. He is the Director of Clinical Research at the Hudson Institute of Medical Research, the Deputy Director of Endocrinology at Monash Health, Consultant Andrologist for the Monash IVF Group, and Professor of Andrology at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Monash University. He is also a Director of Healthy Mail, formerly Andrology Australia, And they are, of course, great partners of the Australian Men's Shed Association. Hello and welcome to the Shed Wireless, Professor Rob McLaughlin. Oh, thanks very much, Aaron. Pleasure to be here. That is quite the CV. Oh, yeah. Well, only once. So you can say that once. (laughs) The hat that I really value, particularly now at this stage of my career, is being able to provide both men and the profession with quality information about male reproductive health disorders and as you alluded to in your intro, some of them are a little bit sensitive, a little bit, you know, sometimes awkward to open up the conversation. So a healthy male and myself are very committed to having those conversations and for fellas to come forward and ask questions that are concerning them, particularly in relation to uh, the reproductive system and ageing. Brilliant. Well, we now have a mechanism for doing that here. Obviously, because it's our first episode, we don't already have a question from a shedder. And so I thought I would frame it around the idea of a frequently asked question or a catch-all, an umbrella question that might just get us underway. And for want of a better one, I've come up with what does ageing mean specifically for men? Is that both specific and broad enough for you to get your teeth into? <laughs> That's a pretty pretty broad one. Yeah, sure. And certainly ageing brings with it a number of things, such as wisdom and balance, <laughs> etc. But on the <laughs> other hand, you know, it does, our bodies do change, our health does change, and things come along we didn't expect to happen to us. Uh, and we can be distressed and confused and wonder what could or should be done about them. So, look... As uh, as they say, you know, ageing beats the alternative. It's better to age than not. But we need to recognise that it does bring with it some changes in the body. And uh, when I was in Seattle, uh, Washington State, uh, I had a very wonderful time there with the andrology people there. And they have a photograph on their wall of the 1936 Washington State Olympic team, the one that went to the Berlin Olympics and won a gold medal. And then 50 years later, on the same shoreline, almost all but one of the crew was still there. And you can see how they've changed. These are the healthiest young men who've become 
healthy older men, but their bodies have changed. Clearly, they've got tummies and they've got some, their muscles aren't the same. They, they've lost some the hair and whatever. But one hopes that they're healthy and happy. And what I'd like to do is to uh, explain along the way what problems might be encountered in that healthy and happy aging process that might be of concern and something we can do, do something about. And one of those that I get quite a lot is, uh, and I think it's driven partly by the press and by very, various interested parties, that or maybe all those changes that can be prevented by testosterone therapy. Yeah, there's every so often uh, there'll be an ad turn up in my social media feed suggesting that my virility is available in a syringe if I need it. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> and it's it's full of wonderful promissory things about, you know, this is revolutionised what your life and everything will come back together again. Clearly, that stuff is fanciful. And unless you have a very clear medically defined testosterone deficiency, and there are criteria for that which your doctor can help you with, there's no place to topping up older men in the hope that you'll rejuvenate them and get them back in the rowing team again. It's just not going to happen. And uh, I think it's a distraction. I think often what we now realise is that many of the changes that we see as we get older, such as uh, you know, less muscular strength, less stamina, a lower sort of uh, energy level, and so on, can be related to the fact that we get diseases along the way or lifestyle changes along the way, which we can do something about. So, you know, taking testosterone, for example, the major determinant of testosterone levels in older men is whether or not they have a comorbidity, particularly obesity. Now, obesity is the primary driver of low-end testosterone levels in, in men, in middle-aged and older men. What one does in that is to restore the lifestyle, restore the energy levels by getting back on the right diet, looking after yourself, regular exercise, you know, walking to the shed rather than driving if it's not too far away, all that kind of stuff. That's what puts the, the, the pep back in your step. It's not going to come from a syringe. It's going to be from recognising that it's your lifestyle on the whole is the major driver of how you feel uh, along the way. So first things first, testosterone in a bottle is not going to restore me. However, testosterone matters. Let's just pause there for a moment. Why does testosterone matter ongoing? Right. Excellent question. What does testosterone do? It, it is far more than the hormone that people think, oh, it just drives sex drive or erections. It has many important roles in the body, particularly driving uh, uh, muscle health, uh, bone health, bone strength, metabolism, uh, glucose handling. It's a very broadly acting hormone. So it's wrong to think of it just in relation to its sexual roles. So you need it your whole life. And we've looked at men who uh, who are older and who are in, in good health, uh, they don't have any problems, uh, and their testosterone levels are similar to what they were in their 20s. It you know, doesn't fall that much. Right. But there is a bit of a narrative that bounces around saying that there's an inevitable march down the hill, as it were. But you're saying that a good lifestyle can, if not completely cease it, at least slow it significantly. Absolutely. And, and that's the message. Uh, and so from a public health point of view, uh, for an older man who perhaps is not feeling as energetic, uh, the stamina, or whatever reason, is concerned about his testosterone status, Clearly, it needs to be checked because something may have happened that needs to be medically addressed. But on the whole, one's going to be looking at his lifestyle, his exercise, his weight, uh, all those factors. That's where the change in his good health will come from. It'll come from something he can directly control and it won't be coming from a bottle. Can you bring back lost testosterone. So let me ask that question by way of example. If I was a footy player in my 20s and 30s, then I do the dad thing in my 40s into my early 50s. It gets away from me a little bit. There's a belly. There's all the inevitables that uh, that happen if you don't do the hard work. Is there a way for me to walk it back to something that can look after me in my 60s, 70s and 80s? Yes. In a word, yes. These changes are reversible. If, say, you know, you used to weigh 85 kilograms or something, and now you've drifted up to 115 kilograms, you know, as you, as you say, you, you've let it slip a bit. If you can lose even half that weight you know, back towards what was your ideal weight, you'll lead to substantial improvements in your energy, 
uh, and in your muscle function and all those other things, and your testosterone will come back up. So this is a, a reversible phenomenon. The idea of lobbying at a gym or somehow moving weights around a room is incredibly intimidating to a lot of people. How do we get back in the game? I haven't used the word gym. I, I realize that gyms are a particular environment that some people love and some people hate. Uh, it doesn't have to be to be that. Uh, obviously, one's diet, one's um, caloric intake, stopping smoking, uh, excessive alcohol, and we know that that limits for for good health alcohol drinking has been lowered enormously from what it might have been 20 years ago. We realize that these little, each one of these little uh, uh, parts of the equation, if they can be chipped away at, will lead to, to weight loss and to better health. And it won't require an expensive gym membership or inconvenience. It could be walking the dog. It could be walking to the shed. It could be playing three rounds of golf a week. It could be any number of things that you, you want to do. Obviously, for each individual, it's going to change. In, in some areas like, you know, in America or wherever, the testosterone has been sold to men as a, a shortcut to better health. Uh, and really, it's uh, something that's been driven by the pharmaceutical industry. It's not something that's been driven in a public health context. If the cause of something is defined, address the cause first. Don't try and, you know, cut around the corner uh, and uh, take a shortcut. There isn't a shortcut. What one thing would you like everybody to take away from this conversation today? You have control. You have control of your lifestyle, of your uh, exposure to things uh, such as cigarette smoking or alcohol exposure. Uh, Each one of those has its own role in taking the edge off you as you get older. And as you alluded, when you're in your 20s and 30s, you might get away with it. When you're in the 40s and 50s, you know what happens to the waist. It gets a bit of a tummy. And if you stay in that mould for, for 20 years, it gets harder and harder. You, you know, you do need to address this for yourself and, I might say, for those of us with sons, to our sons and to our other younger male, and say, listen, this is the time in your life to take a deep breath and say, I'm going to do this because it's, the person who's going to benefit will be me and also my family because, as a general rule, your family wants you around as long as possible. So this should be a stimulus for you to have a look at some of those lifestyle issues throughout your life, particularly from middle age and onwards where uh, things get harder to change unless you act early. You are such an amazing resource for us to have at our disposal, both as an individual, Professor Rob, but also with the power and the knowledge of healthy male behind you. I'm really looking forward to us catching up each episode and I strongly encourage everybody to take advantage of this opportunity. As I say, we're not interested in embarrassing you publicly. Call yourself Pirate Jack if you want. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how you contact us, but we'd really love to ask a real world question rather than something that we're manufacturing at this end. Sure. It's, it's open to all. You, you're not going to worry me. You go right ahead and ask the questions on your mind. It's remarkable, Aaron, when you give people a vehicle or, or, or a mechanism to ask the questions, once the people get going, they just ask. It just opens up. It's that first step, making that first call to see a local doctor or to phone into this to you or whatever. Take the step and you'll find that people are really friendly on the other side. <laughs> we, want, we want to help. <laughs> well, it did occur to me that, in fact, this segment could be a, a training round for the main event. I know it isn't easy to go in and ask this stuff to your doctor, especially if you feel like you have no background knowledge and your hands are down. You know, this might at least help you to feel like you have some knowledge to go into that room with and ask the next level of question. Yeah, that's good. And, you know, avoiding going to Dr. Google. Because I do see a lot of people who go to Dr. Google first and they get themselves, in, they go to different rabbit holes all over the place and get really worked up about it. It's better to talk to a person. You can go to Google later on, but don't use it as your primary source because you'll get misdirected. You really will. Uh, I had a runny nose last week and apparently I'm dying of COVID cancer. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. 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 Dr. Google is no doctor at all. But you are, and thank you for being with us. Look forward to talking next episode, Rob. For a great range of resources and tools to help you live well, head to the Spanner in the Works website. You can just search it up or go to mailhealth.org.au. Everything you hear on The Shed Wireless is created to inform and is not intended to be a substitute for personal advice from your doctor. (laughs) 
We've pulled the door closed on this episode of The Shed Wireless. A really big thank you to Michael Caton. Not only was he generous with his time, the technology was challenging and he worked so hard to make sure that that interview got to you all. A great Australian and let's hope that his health holds up through these challenging times as it does for all of you. Thank you to Raymond Terrace Men's Shed for hosting us and Marty Least and David Helmers behind the scenes there. Professor Rob McLaughlin, you're going to get to know him very well in the weeks and months ahead. Stuart, Rip, Helen Clare, the whole AMSA team. And to you, Paul, as well, thank you for being a part of it, not just as a special guest now, but as a co-host. Did you enjoy that all right? I certainly did. Thank you very much, Aaron. And um, also, yeah, look, I'd like to thank Michael Caton for giving up his time. He's certainly been one of my favourite uh, Aussie actors uh, way back from Uncle Harry in The Sullivans. And <laughs> yes. He, he was my favourite character, in, you know, when, when we all sat down to watch um, The Sullivans every night religiously. And, and, of course, who can forget his role in All Us Taxi to, uh, to Darwin? That was a fantastic film as well. I'm embarrassed to say I haven't seen that yet, and that is on the to-do list for the family, yeah. Oh, you must. You must. I can't guarantee every episode you come on that we'll develop Vote 15 minutes to talk about Bonnie Doon, though, okay, Councillor? No, oh, that's all right. That's right. As the, as you say, I am the Councillor for Bonnie Doon, so I've got to promote my uh, my ward, my patch. But also just uh, another encouragement for those sheds to uh, get involved and put forward your shed to be in the spotlight and, and also some of the... Uh, the shedders in your shed to to get a Guernsey uh, on the shed wireless. So uh, please get involved, sheds. 100%. You know what you blokes are like. You're not going to stick your hand up and say, look at me, look at me, but you might stick your hand up and say, look at this bloke next to me. So I'm talking to you. If you've got somebody nearby who you think is worthy of our attention, I won't say no if we ring them and say, hey, will you come on? But they probably won't volunteer themselves. So please volunteer them on their behalf. Just send us an email to theshedwireless at mensshed.net. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. The Shed Wireless is available via some community radio stations. Contact your local station to find out when you can hear us. If they don't have the show, put them in touch and we'll help them out. You can also find The Shed Wireless in Apple iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Red Circle or just Google us. Wherever you find us, please subscribe so that each new episode gets delivered straight to you. Giving a rating or review helps others to find us more easily. But most of all, please share us with your mates even if they've never seen a shed, through email, newsletters, word of mouth, ring a mate and give him the tip. Maybe your wife might even like it. We love your email correspondence to theshedwireless at mensshed.net or just head to the AMSA website, www.menshed.org and see what's going on with The Shed online while you're there. It's also a great way to connect with a range of resources, websites and national helplines, including Beyond Blue. If you're experiencing a mental health crisis, call Lifeline Australia on 13 11 14 or Men's Line on 1300 99 78 99. Thanks for listening to The Shed Wireless, the wireless you'd listen to if you were in the shed.